Congressional Policy Institute, WCPI. Welcome to our Capitol Hill Lunch Briefing on Women Veterans Mental Health and Suicide Prevention. For almost 20 years, we have hosted an annual event honoring women veterans, a tradition we plan to continue for many more years to come. As most of you know, WCPI is a nonpartisan, nonprofit public policy organization. Our mission is to bring together a community of bipartisan women policymakers and trusted partners to advance issues of importance to women, develop the next generation of women leaders, and foster a more effective and representative democracy. We work closely with the members and staff of the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues. And I would like to thank those congressional briefing co-sponsors, the leadership of the Women's Caucus, Congresswoman Madeline Bean and Jennifer gonzalez Colon, co-chairs, and Congresswomen Lucy McBath and Kat Kamak, vice chairs. Our thanks to our longtime partners, DAV and the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, IAEA. We are grateful to DAV and IAEA for their partnership and work on behalf of women veterans for many years. We are grateful to Lumbeck LLC for making this briefing possible. We appreciate Lumbeck's support for women veterans' mental health care and their work to research and develop medical treatments to improve the lives of people with brain health conditions. We thank today's speakers, Dr. Lisa Brenner, Naomi Mathis, and Caitlin Yancey, each of whom will be introduced in just a moment. We are also very pleased to welcome Lourdes Tiglau, um, who is Executive Director for the Center for Women Veterans at the Department of Veterans Affairs, and Dr. Irene Trowell Harris, former Director of the Center, who is joining us virtually. I should note Dr. Trowell Harris was the first African-American woman to achieve the rank of Major General in the U.S. National Guard and has been a panelist at this event. We also welcome Ambassador and former Congresswoman Connie Morella, who is joining us virtually, is one of WCPI's founding board members and former board vice chair. <clears throat> Lastly, before we begin, and very importantly, on behalf of WCPI and our partners today, I would like to thank any attendees who have served or are currently serving in the military. If there are, and I know there are, any current or former service members in the room, would you please stand? We also would like to recognize any veterans who are watching the live stream. Thank you all for your service and for joining us today. We will not forget. If you would like to tweet about this event, we encourage you and others to do so by using the hashtag WCPIVets. I'm now very pleased to introduce Congresswoman Madeline Dean, Democratic Vice Chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues. Congresswoman Dean is serving her second term, representing the 4th District of Pennsylvania and serves on financial services and judiciary committees. She has worked to make women veterans mental health care a priority and mental health care generally a priority and launched the Women Veterans Task Force to ensure that more than 2 million women veterans have access to health care benefits and resources that they have earned. Well, good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you in person and those virtually. I'm Madeline Dean, Congresswoman for the 4th Congressional District of Pennsylvania, which is suburban Philadelphia, so just an Amtrak ride away. I also have the privilege this session of, of having served and finishing my service as co-chair of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus, as Cindy just talked about, alongside Jennifer gonzalez Colon. It has been an extraordinary pr uh, privilege to be head of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus. I want to recognize Megan Ruan of my team, who has really been the champion for our work on the Bipartisan Women's Caucus. So a little hand for Megan. We've had the good fortune of working with WCPI all this time. Uh, from the day I came to, to Congress, you have welcomed all of us uh, and lifted us. So I'm so grateful to join you again for this briefing on women veterans and their health and specifically mental health and suicide prevention, incredibly important areas 
of our health, of veterans' health. Thank you especially, Cindy Hall, WCPI president, for your friendship and your leadership all these years. And Cynthia Ramos, WCPI policy director, thank you so much for all of your extraordinary work. I have to take a moment of personal privilege, if you don't mind, as we begin the ending of the 116th, uh, 117th Congress. And as we look forward to the 118th, as I will be finishing my role uh, as the Democratic uh, co-chair of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus. Our work would not have been possible without you. I just want everybody here to understand that. What WCPI has done to lift the work of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus um, is just remarkable. Uh, what you have taught us, uh, what you have given of yourselves for us to try to do the work to reach across the aisle in very fraught times uh, has been so invaluable and I've learned from your leadership. Uh, so I promise uh, to not go away. You're stuck with me, even though I will not be uh, the co-chair. I wanna continue to learn uh, from you and to work alongside you, WCPI. Thank you to our speakers today, Dr. Lisa Brenner, thank you so much. Uh, for all of your excellence and, and expertise, Naomi Mathis, Caitlin Yancey, uh, and others who may be speaking too. So thank you very much. Uh, and I want to thank, of course, Lucy McBath, Jennifer gonzalez Colon, Kat Kamak, um, as well as Representatives Lauren Underwood and Nancy Mace, I believe is also joining us, Lauren, my colleague and classmate. Uh, it is crucial that we have the perspectives of our veterans uh, like Naomi and Caitlin, as well as healthcare professionals like Dr. Brenner, to learn how we can better support service members, especially when they return home, especially women veterans. My office has the privilege to work with many veterans throughout Pennsylvania. We actually have a quarterly meeting of our advisory committee around veterans and veterans affairs, uh, and I learned so much from them. The bravery, the sacrifice, the selflessness that is exemplified in your spirit of service is a constant inspiration to me and to our country. And it should motivate us, it does motivate me, in Congress, uh, in advocacy groups, in Veterans Affairs, and everywhere, to ensure access to affordable healthcare and other resources like housing and job opportunities. Congress has a role to play uh, to help give the support that you, the veterans, deserve. I'm glad that in 2020, we passed the Veterans Compact Act to expand mental health care for women veterans, including those facing homelessness. We have homeless women veterans in my district. It is heartbreaking. And so we are trying to reach out and get them uh, the resources they absolutely deserve uh, as veterans and as um, Americans. This year, the House passed two bills focused on expanding uh, resources for mental health. And while they haven't yet been voted on the Senate, we will keep pushing. To highlight them, the Strong Veterans Act would require the VA to update training for VA workforce and veterans crisis hotline staff to expand access to mental health care and provide outreach to veterans regarding mental health resources. And the Removes Copay Act would mean that the VA cannot collect copays for the first three mental health, mental health outpatient visits in a year. Mental health is important to me and to my family. I have two brothers who are veterans, veterans uh, of the Vietnam War, uh, Navy veterans, uh, one of whom served over in Vietnam, but mental health is important to all of us veterans or not. So I wanna just say a sincere thank you for the extraordinary work you're doing. Know that I am committed to making sure we do everything to expand mental health, to remove stigma around mental health care. We all uh, will access or need it at some point in our lives or our families' lives. So thank you for giving me the time to be with you at all today. And as I said, Cindy, you're not done with me. I will continue to learn from you. Thank you. I also want to say that we have, it has been such a privilege working with you. Um, and we're thrilled to hear we're not done done with the <laughs> And thank you for all your work on these issues. I'm pleased next to introduce Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, a registered nurse. Congresswoman Underwood is currently serving her second term representing the 14th District of Illinois 
and she serves on the Appropriations and Veterans Affairs Committees, including membership on the Health Subcommittee, very appropriate for our topic today. She has introduced legislation to address the unique health needs of women veterans and prevents veteran suicide through proactive screening and counseling. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to be with you today. I'm so pleased that we were able to open up with my colleague, Natalie Dean, a great leader here in the Congress. And I'm grateful to be back with the Women's Congressional Policy Institute, Disabled American Veterans, and Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Thank you all for hosting this briefing and um, you know, for putting a spotlight on this urgent issue. I've been proud to serve on the House Veterans Affairs Committee since coming to Congress. And one of our committee's top priorities has been mental health and suicide prevention. We know that veterans die by suicide far too often. In 2020, the suicide rate for veterans was more than 75, I'm sorry, 57% higher than the rate for non-veteran adults. But we started to see some glimmers of hope with the veteran suicide rate decreasing in each of the past two years of available data. From 2019 to 2020, the age-adjusted suicide rate for women veterans fell by more than 14%. This is encouraging progress, but we have so much more work left to do, particularly for our women veterans who often face unique risk factors for suicide. For example, one in three women veterans report that they experience sexual harassment or assault while serving in the military. And research shows that military Sexual trauma is a significant risk factor for suicide ideation, suicide attempt, and completed suicides. Based on these data, we know that we need to expand access to high quality mental health services for women veterans, as well as evidence-based suicide prevention initiatives. One bill that I have been especially focused on is my Lethal Means Safety Training Act. Lethal Means Safety is an intentional voluntary practice to reduce suicide risk while limiting access uh, while in crisis to lethal means like firearms, medications, and sharp instruments. And the data are clear that it works. Based on this evidence, the last administration, the Trump administration, implemented a requirement for every clinician within the Veterans Health Administration to complete a training on lethal means safety. My legislation would expand this requirement to additional VA staff, as well as community care providers and family caregivers, so that no matter where a veteran is receiving their care, they'll be talking with someone who's been trained in the life-saving, um, trained to have life-saving lethal means safety conversations. In addition to suicide prevention initiatives, we also need to expand access to mental health care for our women veterans and remove financial barriers that may be preventing our veterans from seeking care. Currently, veterans receiving care through the VA can be charged out-of-pocket costs for preventive services, even though almost all private health plans are required to provide coverage for preventive services without charging co-payments. To right this wrong, I introduced the Bipartisan Veterans Preventive Health Coverage Fairness Act, which will eliminate all out-of-pocket charges for preventive services so that a pregnant veteran can access the services that they need for perinatal depression, and all women veterans can access gender-specific preventive care without facing any cost barriers. These bills are examples of the bipartisan work that we can and we must do together to address the urgent issue of mental health and suicide prevention among women veterans, and we don't have any time to wait. I hope my colleagues here today will join me in supporting the Lethal Means Safety Training Act and the Veterans Preventive Health Coverage Fairness Act so we can get these bills across the finish line to save lives and get our women veterans the mental health care they need and deserve. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today and take good care of yourselves, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congressman Underwood. Your legislation is critical. We can say that. It's bipartisan. Um, and we really appreciate all your hard work on this issue. Um, I know we are expecting Congressman Gonzalez Colon, but I think um, she may be delayed or coming shortly. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Cynthia Ramos, WCPI's policy director, who will introduce each of our speakers and moderate the discussion. Thank you, Cindy. 
According to the VA, the rate of suicide among women veterans is nearly twice as high as that of male veterans. As you hear from our speakers today, we hope this discussion will help provide some new perspective and insight into the mental health challenges facing women veterans. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Lisa Brenner. Dr. Brenner is clinical research psychologist and director at the VA Rocky Mountain Mental Illness Research Education and Clinical Center in Aurora, Colorado. Beyond her work with the VA, she is also vice chair of research and professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Dr. Brenner has more than 20 years of experience working with women veterans and has championed numerous national efforts to prevent suicide. Her research interests include traumatic brain injury and comorbid mental health conditions, including suicide. Providing high quality, evidence-based care to veterans is her priority. Thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, such a great opportunity to talk a little bit about what we're doing. And I really struggled. I know I have a limited amount of time, so we're gonna kind of cover a lot of things quickly. Uh, I feel like this, each of these things I'm gonna cover uh, could be a, a talk on its own. And so the theme, the, the connective tissue for all this is how do we meet women veterans where they are? And when I say that, I mean in terms of clinical settings, in terms of interventions, and in terms of contextual factors, like we've already heard about, things that increase risk that, you know, drive mental health symptoms like homelessness. Um, I also really want to acknowledge uh, the team at the Rocky Mountain Myrec. Um, this is an amazing group of folks in Denver and actually in Salt Lake City. Um, and two researchers in particular that, that I want to highlight. This is uh, two women researchers who um, are very focused on women's issues. Uh, I told them I would uh, call them out today. So Dr. Lindsay Monteith and Claire Hoffmeyer, this is for you because you're amazing. And not only are they amazing, but they're amazing because they both have families and children and they've managed through COVID to keep being able to do research. And I'm so proud of them and just want to call them out. Um, you've heard already that women, uh, women veterans are a particular risk for suicide um, and that this risk continues to grow over time, that we have seen some decreases. And that, that in particular, women veterans are at increased risk in comparison to non-veterans. So there is something about kind of having, being a veteran that does seem to increase risk for women and for men. We also have to remember that this is happening contextually against the backdrop of suicide being an issue for all Americans, right? And so we have special and increased stress perhaps associated to history of being a veteran, uh, against a backdrop where suicide is increasing on a whole. And how do we manage things both uh, in the big context of being a, a citizen of this country and also for veterans in specific? We also heard uh, about lethal means safety. safety. And I, I want to also highlight why this is so, so important. Um, part of the reason it's really important, in particular related to firearms, the lethal means safety can be related to a wide range of things, is that firearms are so lethal. And when individuals, women and men use firearms, we don't often have another chance to intervene. And that is why you hear us focus on that so much. Um, so I'm gonna hear, we're starting the trip around the world, going to clinical settings first, okay? So one way we could meet women where they are is bringing suicide prevention to places that maybe we're not used to seeing it. And so one of our teams um, thought about what, what if we start to think about reproductive healthcare settings as a place to do suicide prevention. Uh, we know that women go see their reproductive health care providers, that um, they rate this as one of their top needs. Uh, they have intimate relationships with their health care providers. They spend more time with them and talk with them than maybe some of their health care providers. And we also know that nearly half of women veterans with reproductive health diagnoses also have at least one mental health diagnosis. So how do we meet people again where they are and treat, uh, treat the conditions together? So we, we've done some early work and I just wanna share some words from women veterans. These are qualitative interviews. One woman said, there's a lot of women who will be uh, able to open up to their OBGYN. Obviously it's a more intimate exam so they feel more apt to opening up about mental health or suicide. I think any opportunity that someone has to open up about mental health issues is an opportunity and we have to find them. Another woman said, and I'll paraphrase here, that um, 
we know that mental health symptoms or things that we call mental health symptoms can be driven like by things like hormones. So could we involve healthcare providers who are really smart about uh, things like hormones into addressing mental health and suicide? So the next clinical setting that we're really working on is meeting women in their homes. How do we help provide healthcare and homes? And I'm not specifically talking about telehealth today, but I'm talking about um, apps and, and um, online interventions, evidence-based treatments. And I put this out there for you, just wanna encourage you. Uh, the other awesome thing is that these are all available to everybody. So if you're a veteran or not in this room, all these resources are available to you. Uh, if you have insomnia, the path to better sleep intervention is particularly good. Check it out, evidence-based. Um, so we know that women may want to get their um, their treatment at 10 at night, 2 in the morning, 6 in the morning, 12 in the afternoon. They may or may not want to talk to a psychotherapist, and we can provide them with things that they can do asynchronously in their own time that has evidence. So in addition to these, we are developing two new treatments. One is uh, CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy for depression. In other countries, if you go to your primary care provider and have depression, you will get online CBT for depression. It is an excellent intervention. We are developing that for VA and we'll have that available to everybody. So this is something people can do on their own time when it makes sense for them. Similarly, developing an online cognitive behavioral therapy for suicide prevention. The other thing is that we know that women veterans get care at places outside the VA. And we know that not everybody spends as much time thinking about veterans and suicide prevention as we do. So we've developed something called the Suicide Risk Management Consultation Program. This is a program for all providers, uh, VA or non-VA, that are working with veterans. What you do is you put a consult in and uh, we'll help you know about best evidence-based practices for working with veterans. We'll help you learn about the you know, culture of veterans. We'll help you know, learn about um, best ways to intervene. We'll review the case with you. And this is another way to ensure that veterans get the best care from all providers. Um, this is an, a no fee service for everybody. And um, these folks are awesome. I get to work with them all the time. They're amazing. The other thing is working with suicidal folks is challenging and can be really hard on healthcare providers. We're hearing a lot about healthcare providers. This is another way for healthcare providers to get support and also be able to feel that they are protected in being able to work with really high risk folks. So again, seeing people where they are and providing the care. Um, in terms of interventions, I'm a psychologist, but it turns out not everybody likes psychotherapy. I get it. Um, so we are thinking, how do we mechanistically step back and think about mental health diagnoses from a mechanistic standpoint? And we now know that PTSD and depression are di driven by inflammation. So could we mechanistically treat these conditions by stepping backwards? and decreasing inflammation. So my team, I have two grants, one that's finished, one that's underway right now, where we are looking at probiotic interventions for PTSD. One of these was funded by um, the VA research, who I greatly appreciate. The other one is funded by um, NIH. But how do we really help like calm the fires of PTSD by decreasing inflammation? Totally different way of looking at this. Also, I think super helpful in terms of decreasing stigma. These are whole body conditions. They're not just mental health conditions. People with PTSD have much higher um, GI related problems, much higher rates of autoimmune disorder. Let's be smart. Let's think about whole humans and whole health. And finally, um, I wanna talk about contextual challenges. And we all know that for, for many, many years, mental health, and suicide prevention sat kind of in mental health clinics. We thought about um, suicide as only being related to having a mental health diagnosis. We know now that that's not true. We know that folks cannot have a mental health diagnosis, have an incredible amount of stressors related to contextual factors and social determinants of health that creates risk to the point where people um, die by suicide. And this is so important because one thing that this does is it really encourages all of us to think about what could we do about suicide prevention? This is like everybody's job in the VA. If you don't know this already, VA actually is rolling out the largest in the world ever uh, universal risk screening for suicide prevention. Um, it's actually incredible. That's a different talk. I'm not gonna talk about it today. 
One group that we've really been focusing on in terms of social determinants is Asian American and Pacific Islander veterans. Um, the rates of suicide amongst cohorts, and I say cohorts very intentionally because sometimes um, in science and in other ways, we lump people together that are actually very, very different. And if you think about Asian American and Pacific Islander, that is many, many communities that have many different needs. And we are in the Rocky Mountain Myrick working to disaggregate these communities, understand the differential needs of these communities and help decrease risk. Because we know that the rate in these communities are going up and consistently going up um, even higher than some other communities. So we're looking at things like um, what kinds of racially based experiences have people had in the past few years that are driving um, risk. We're also looking at things like where do people live in terms of communities? What resources do they have available to them? And then what are cultural beliefs around mental health and healthcare that may get in the way um, and create barriers around getting mental health care. Finally, um, I want to just highlight uh, one community in particular. I was talking about it a little bit earlier over there. Um, this fall, I had the chance to go to Guam. Um, Guam is an amazing place, but it's so amazing because the Guamanian veterans that are there. And um, if you don't know about Guam, you should. Um, so this is like, I, I, I've said every day that I'm in the VA working, do one thing for Guam. So, because I, I can't stop, these, these folks need our help. And we did a bunch of interviews there and, and one of the vet veterans we interviewed said, the challenges here relate to the tyranny of distance. It is just so, so far. And how do we help connect, play off the strengths that they have there, community-based, family-based strengths to really ensure that we help all veterans, whether they live close, uh, just to train right away or several flights away in Guam. And I thank you all and look forward to getting your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenner. And as you said, meeting women veterans where they are is such an important part of looking at this issue holistically. So thank you. Um, next, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Naomi Mathis. Naomi is a combat disabled Air Force veteran. Earlier this year, she was appointed Associate National Legislative Director in the more than 1 million member DAV. As a member of DAV's legislative team in DC, Naomi works to advance legislation and policies critical to disabled veterans and their families. She has spread the word about DAV services, including appearing in public service campaigns and interviews. While in the Air Force, Naomi has deployed three times to Iraq and Kuwait and attained the rank of Staff Sergeant before being medically retired in 2007. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm the only one up here without notes, but um, so I want to tell you a little bit about me. Uh, you heard my bio, but let me tell you what came in behind that. I joined in 2000, the Air Force, and then in 2001, I was gone. I was deployed. 2002, I was deployed again. 2003 is when we went into Iraq. I want you guys to think about that for just a second. It's been almost 20 years since we went into Iraq. So things that we are talking about, and it's funny because they stole my thunder about meeting um, a woman veteran where they are. Uh, so back then I was maybe uh, 28 years old uh, before I was medically retired out. At 31 years old, I had a hysterectomy and I also had a newborn. And this was due to complications of who knows. Um, but hormones were out of, in, in whack. I had acute post-traumatic stress disorder and I have this baby who is completely dependent on me and I'm looking at this child. And one thing that we don't talk about, we talk about suicide, but one of the things that we don't talk about, which is actually a criteria in the VA to get a 70% is also homicidal ideations. And so I'm looking at this baby and I had homicidal ideations. Not sure why, not sure it was the medications, the hormones, I don't know what was going on, straight up PTSD, not really sure, but that's what happened. Now, I'm looking at this child and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe that I just thought that. So let me take myself out of the picture. I did not go through with it, thank God, but, I will tell you that there wasn't a very far leap between either 
ending up in prison and losing my child, obviously, or taking myself out of the equation. So one of the things I decided to do was um, after I got out, got the job with the DAV, of course, and used my passion that I had for the military because I was medically retired, but really my career was being taken away from me in my mind, and used that passion that I had and put it forward with DAV and in helping veterans and helping someone that was in my place. So all of these things all come together, the community of the VSOs, right? Having a community of, because when you leave the military, you leave that camaraderie. So the community of VSOs, just veterans, just having your neighbor being there and being available. Hey, is there anything I can do to help you? Policy being passed touch points, where we meet the veteran, where we meet the woman veteran in the clinical setting, outside of the clinical setting, wherever. However, we need to continue to reach out and to do that, and that has been my driving force. Now, at, I told you at 32, um, I had hysterectomy. 38, uh, I went through menopause, full-blown menopause. And so now I have this whole other thing going on with hormones, but I will tell you one thing that did save me, all those years of therapy <laughs> and all that medication, but no, all those years of therapy, they actually taught me things, um, tools that I can use to uh, not get back into that place. But I'll tell you what, it has not been easy. So here I stand before you almost 20 years out of in going into Iraq and there is a whole other population of women veterans that their need needs to be met, not just the childbearing age, which of course is extremely important, but let's also talk about those that are beyond the childbearing age and going through a very similar struggle. So if I could reach back and touch back to that younger self, and tell her, hey, it's okay. You're gonna be standing at the ring, you know, where you're at <laughs> in front of congressional members and having a discussion about mental health and how you came over the other side out and told you you were nuts. There's no way because you just feel like you're drowning. So I just wanna tell you there's good news out there. Out there. I'm not a complete success story. I'm still working on my mental mental health every single day, but I do want to say thank you to every single person that has worked on policy to make mental health and suicide prevention a, uh, a, a driving force and, and to, has, who has worked on policy. I want to thank you so much, and I want to thank um, the DAV, Caitlin, and everyone else that, um, and of course, thank you for having me. God bless. Well, you may only I'm certain there are so many women veterans who can see themselves in your story. So thank you for your openness and being willing to share your, your journey. Well, I am now going to introduce Congresswoman Nancy Mace. Congresswoman Mace currently is serving her first term representing the first district of South Carolina. She serves on the Oversight and Reform, Transportation and Infrastructure, and Veterans Affairs Committees including membership on the Economic Opportunity Subcommittee. Prior to serving in Congress, she was the first woman to graduate from the Citadel's Corps of Cadets in 1999. Congressman, Congresswoman Mace has worked to pass legislation providing financial assistance to veterans and their families. Congresswoman? Good morning. How are y'all? Y'all are fine. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm also the first Republican woman ever elected to Congress from the state of South Carolina. There are so many barriers that we have, we as women still have to break. And so it's awesome to be in a room full of women today. I am not used to it at the Citadel. I was one of four the first year, two dropped out by Christmas, and there were just two of us that finished the first year. I eventually, when I graduated, I started my own company. At one point, my kids were really little. And I got into commercial real estate again, a place where that were not there were not many 
men, even today, not even half of Congress have women in it. And uh, it'd be great if they were all women 100%, because it's been that way with men for a long time. But we still have a long, long way to go. And I appreciate everything that everyone is doing in this room today to advance our causes. Uh, and in some ways, our goals are the same, but um, how we get there might be different depending on what our political leanings are. But there's no time like the present to work together on issues that matter. In fact, just a week, in, a week ago or so, we had the election. Um, it showed that centrist, left of center, right of center, that is where America is right now. Um, and the issues that, that we care about, uh, we've got to work together on, particularly women's issues, and especially for women who are veterans. And I have several in my family. Um, you know, women have never been required to serve, but they've always served. And the challenges that, that they've had have been different. I know this uh, in the military, at least by speaking to women who are members of my family, what they talk about is much, much different. The harassment, the sexual harassment, the physical harassment, the military sexual trauma, you know, the things and issues that we face, uh, that women face are so much different. Access to the VA. Women are the last ones to go and ask for help, whether it's mental health, whether it's um, reporting an issue to your superior. I know this just from talking to many women, but uh, there are inherent challenges when we come forward with our issues. And one, one story that I've shared very frequently is when I was 16, I was raped by a classmate of mine in high school. I dropped out of school, became a waitress at a Waffle House. I learned some very tough lessons during some very tough times. And I learned um, that uh, it's hard to have the courage to step forward because of the way that we are treated when we do step forward. And that is no different in the civilian world than it is in the military. And the military might even be worse because sometimes that person might be someone in the chain of command. And um, in the transition from women from active duty service to veterans, those issues are also, uh, you know, much larger um, for them, more challenging for them than many of the men. And so I'm very cognizant because of the experiences I've had as a woman, the first that I've taken, the uh, trauma I've had in my own life. I'm very sensitive to the issues that each and every one of us care about in the room because I want to make it better. It took me 25 years to talk about being raped and, um, Having that kind of courage, but the courage to make a difference to me was worth all the arrows that I took on that particular issue. And uh, I'm willing to continue to take the arrows and take the attacks. Uh, and in fact, when Roe was overturned, um, you know, I talked about abortion as someone who's pro life, but there's got to be some middle ground. And I actually, you know, ran on that as an issue as a woman because I heard about women's voices and wanted to make sure that they were represented. On veterans' issues, uh, veterans' homelessness is an issue that's very important near, near and dear to my heart. Um, it is an issue in South Carolina. I represent a district that uh, has about one third of all veterans in the entire state of South Carolina are in the South Carolina's first congressional district, which we call the Low Country. The Low Country, um, the gerrymandering of the districts in South Carolina, Jim Fiber and I, our districts pretty much are very similar. They're very wedded. And uh, between him and I in the Low Country, we have about half of all the military bases in South Carolina right there in the Low Country as well. So um, I work on veterans' homelessness. I work on LGBTQ issues for veterans as well for the VA committee. Last year, I went on my first co down with the Indo-Pacific region with Chairman Takano, looking at, we went and visited Japan and South Korea and Taiwan. I was a token Republican on the trip, which made it bipartisan. Because it was bipartisan, we had a meeting, we were able to get a meeting with President Tsai of Taiwan. And um, the benefit of working together and reaching across the aisle, I've, I've you know, been kind of a unicorn and a lone star, sometimes the only Republican voting with SD Moses, with Democrats on some of those bills. And, um, and I do it willingly. And uh, it's important that when we're looking at veterans issues for women too, one of the things I'm taking good care of and trying to have some uh, specific insight too is how we're treating women's issues uh, at the VA hospital, for example. Um, those are very care for medical support and care for women. Um, you know, in my state of South Carolina, even whether you're a veteran or not, we have entire rural areas that don't have a single OBG line of that. And then you got to travel how many counties over to go find one. And then if you're a vet, good luck getting an appointment, right? And so um, yeah, those issues are very challenging, particularly in states where that is the uh, overwhelming representation where there often isn't the doctor that you can go see. And so uh, also other issues that we're dealing with at the VA, um, you know, cost of living in certain places. I know where I represent Charleston, uh, you can't live off the salaries that are provided, whether you're a nurse or a doctor or supportive staff. And so um, I want to say thank you. 
you know, uh, for women veterans out there, if you're willing to take a bullet for our country, then we should do everything in our power to make sure that you're taken care of when you come home. And just want to thank everyone for their service and thank you for your time this morning. We really appreciate it. And if you have any ideas on how we can better improve women's lives and active duty or uh, veteran status, um, let us know at mace.house.gov. Our door is always open. We'll open anyone who's willing to work with us. In fact, SCI lost your card. We got to get together after this because <laughs> we got some stuff to work on. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Congressman Mays, um, for your commitment to bipartisanship, and we look forward to continuing our work with you next Congress. Thank you. Now, I'm pleased to welcome our last speaker, Ms. Caitlin Yancey. Caitlin serves as IABA's Associate Director of Government Affairs, helping to lead the organization's advocacy efforts in D.C. She has served in the U.S. Navy for four years as an aviation electronics technician third class. At IABA, she supports the organization's efforts to bring veterans' issues out of the Beltway and into the consciousness of the American public. In particular, Caitlin hones in on the issues that face our nation's women veterans and service members. There are gaps in health care compared to the male counterparts, as well as the sexual assault and domestic violence problems within the military and veterans communities. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's very interesting, the last two um, speakers that I heard, because they definitely tie in a little bit to what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I, again, want to say thank you to the Women Congressional Policy Institute for having me today. I also want to say thank you to the representatives that were here and spoke today. All of them voted yes on the Honoring Our Pact Act, and we are so appreciative of that. So I'm a woman veteran. <laughs> Um, I did not deploy. I served in the Navy from 2010 to 2014, as, um, as was already said, as an aviation electronics technician. Um, but before I joined the military, which, again, it's very interesting, uh, Congresswoman makes this story. Before I joined the military, I was sexually assaulted at the age of 17. That was the first person that, had ever, that I had ever been with. Um, I joined the military to get away from him because there was no escaping him. Joined the military. I met my husband. It was a blissful six months before I, I came to find out that he had a lot of undealt mental health issues himself. And it entered, it entered into a very difficult uh, mental and uh, mental and emotionally abusive relationship. Since then, he has worked through all of his issues. Well, I can't say all of his issues because we all have issues that come up all the time. But he has worked through many of those issues and is a completely different human being than I than stood before me six months after we got together. Through all of that, I stayed. We had a child. It was not blissful anymore. It was very difficult. And I was forced to leave the military because I knew that I could not leave my baby son with him because he was not a safe person to leave him with. So I left. As Naomi said, she felt like her service was taken away from her. I felt the same for a very different reason. So I left the military, I got a really good job, and I threw myself into being a mother, a student, a wife, everything that I could throw myself into to not focus on all of the pain that I had already been through. We had another baby, probably not the best decision of the time because I still had not dealt with my own issues. And when my daughter was four months old, my son was diagnosed with leukemia. So compacting all of these issues. I was forced to quit my job, because somebody has to stay home, he cannot go to school. Forced to quit my job and stay home. And at that point, I realized that I could no longer push away any of those thoughts. And they just kept flooding in and flooding in and flooding in. And to me, I grew up with a mother who definitely did utilize mental health care services. So I knew that it was an option. But to me, as a veteran, I didn't think that the VA was for me. I didn't serve in a combat zone. I served in Oceana, Virginia, where I did nothing. I mean, I did many things and it was a great job, but the VA was not for me. The VA was for those who had sacrificed so much. It was not a place for me. So I remember sitting on my couch one day. I put my six month old to bed and I looked at my son and I was like, would it be so bad? Would it be so bad if I just disappeared? I mean, there is all of this medication in my house for my son. If I just never existed anymore, would it be that bad? 
And I remember picking up my phone to look at the medications that were in my house at that time to see what the dosages were, what could be the point that I didn't have to exist anymore. I didn't have to feel all of these feelings ever again. And my husband, who was working as a dishwasher at the time at a local Olive Garden, because that's the job that he could get on such short notice, um, walked in the door and looked at me. And I immediately, like, I, like it was the last bit of fight that I had in me, started the largest fight that we have ever had in our entire relationship, which telling you that we went through a lot of issues six months after, that should tell you something. So largest fight. And I remember him asking me a question. I can't remember what the question was. And all I said to him was, I just want to die. I don't want to live here anymore. And he looks at me and he goes, what are you, what are you talking? You've never even said anything to me before. Everything's been fine, but it was never fine. I just was really good at masking it. So standing here today, I have never told that story before. And I feel like this is a platform. Those of us who are in these positions, those of us who have this voice, we need to use it to tell our stories if we're comfortable. I wouldn't tell the story if I wasn't comfortable. Yes, I am emotional. I have a 10 month old baby. So, you know, things just come out. Um, but we need to tell our stories because if we don't tell our stories then those who don't, who feel alone, who are sitting on their couches wondering if they should even exist anymore, they still feel alone. And telling our stories puts those out there and helps them to know they're no longer alone. So we can make changes uh, through Congress. And there are so many great changes that have been made. Um, IVA was one, IVA was really strong in fighting for the Commander John Scott Hannon Mental Health Care Improvement Act, which gave grants to community groups to help veterans where they are, bringing mental health care where you are. And that is amazing, but we need to tell our stories. We need to give veterans a platform to make sure that they know that they are heard. One of the things that IVA does for this is we have a, a member fly-in event where we bring our members from all over the country and we get to take them in and let them tell their stories to members of Congress so that members of Congress can see what issues are impacting and the amount of stories that I have heard that are not so different from mine is just heartbreaking. So there are, some, there are a few data points that I do want to share because while we hear so much about military sexual trauma as we should, we do not hear anything, well, not as much about intimate partner violence. And that is devastating because as someone who suffered and had no idea who to talk to, we, I had fleeing family and I did go to, to some appointments through them. I still felt so alone in the military. And when I came to IEVA, that was one of my number one uh, one of my number one efforts was to make sure that we started asking those questions, make sure that we started fighting for those who felt like no one was looking out for them. And one of the most heartbreaking numbers that we got was that 40% of our women members felt that they were physically threatened or were actually physically hurt while they were in the service. That is devastating and we're not talking about it. So while we are making amazing changes. We need to remember that there are issues that we are not focusing on. And that is been, and that is why intimate partner violence will continue to be one of the things that I fight for most because it's something that affects me and affects so many out there and 40% of the women veterans who took our survey. I wanna thank you for allowing me to tell my story here today. Again, it was the first time, so I'm sorry if it was a little shaky. Um, but I, I really appreciate it, and I would love to work with any one of you on, on ways that we can help women veterans through, the, through transition while they're leaving the service, telling their stories, because again, that is so important, and making them feel like they have a place to go. One last little, little bit when we're talking about feeling like they have a place to go. The VA motto currently leaves out women veterans, not just women veterans, but any veteran that does not identify as male. So while we continue to have he who shall have borne the battle on the front door of every single VA facility, it tells a woman veteran or any veteran that does not identify as a male that it's not for them. And so until we change that, there are so many who are going to walk up there and say, this isn't for me. I don't feel like I belong here.
So that's my last little thing is that we need to make sure that we change the VA motto. Again, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for giving IBA the opportunity to speak and looking forward to working with all of you and answering any questions. Thank you so much, Caitlin, again, um, for sharing your personal story. And um, again, thank you to all of our speakers today and what they shared. And we will now move to Q&A and discussion time. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and use the mic provided by the staff. And please state your name and office before asking your question. Anyone want to start the first question? OK. Do I have to use the mic? Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Kat Kirkman. I am the Director of Military and Veteran Affairs for Congressman Dwight Evans, uh, and I'm an Air Force veteran as well. Um, first and foremost, uh, Caitlin and Naomi, thank you so much for sharing your story uh, as a vet who has also experienced some of the things that you described. Um, it is it is still amazing to hear your stories and to not feel alone. And so thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, I have two questions actually for Dr. Brenner. So the first one is for the supporting, um, the suicide risk management consultation program. Is this for any organization nationwide or is this a Colorado kind of program? Any organization nationwide. Fantastic. And then my second question has to do with the apps and, and perhaps with the VA in general. Um, it's an issue I can at least say personally I, I worry about is privacy and security. Yep. So how secure are these apps? Who has access to this information? And how can you tell myself and I tell my other veterans that I work with that these are secure and safe for them to use? That's a great question. I do not want to pretend like I am IT genius. So I, I believe that this is the correct answer. But all of these apps and the programs actually live on your own desktop and on your own phone. They don't collect data that's transmitted to the VA in any way. And if you clear your cache, say you're doing it on a computer, it clears all your data. So this is much like any other program that you use on your own personal computer. Um, there would be uh, benefits to finding ways to kind of coordinate and have the state of come inside VA that doesn't exist yet. And so we don't have access to it. So, you know, we do need veterans to bring in data to show us that they're using these um, for the most part. I hope that, does that answer? Yes, thank you. Okay, yeah. And, and can I just say one reason I really know this is because we just got a grant. Uh, we're working on the Path to Better Sleep um, um, web-based program. And um, we're working on how to how to facilitate for folks with moderate to severe TDI. And we are wishing that we could capture some of the data and we can't. So we actually have the opposite problem. So that's why I probably know okay. that it's um, true. Thank you. Yep. I think we can do this. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Donna. I'm from the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee with Senator John Metzger. I just want to thank you all for being here. It's really, really uh, amazing to hear both your stories, Caitlin and Um, It's very thoughtful, and I think it's really good to see the lot of issues that we work on. Um, and Dr. Brenner, we hear your name a lot in briefings. It was nice to hear more about the work. Yeah, Rocky Mountain. Yes, it's yes. a nice and you were talking a little bit about some cohorts that you're looking at with, uh, you know, suicide prevention and what the annual veteran suicide data is telling you. And you mentioned the American Island was the one to do, but I was just curious um, if there were other cohorts either in gender uh, and race, ethnicity, et cetera, that you guys are focused on and kind of thinking that different ways to reduce suicide there. And then my second question is on. Uh, if you you were identifying the group what that kind of suicide veteran suicide prevention from the family level and mm -hmm. kind of children within that, um, that was something that we heard about and tried to work on. So, 
Sorry. No, that's that's great. Um, I'm uh, I didn't say. Did I say today that everything I say today may not be gay? I feel like I should say that. Like, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry if I didn't say that before. All right. Uh, anyway, um, uh, you know, I think we're working on a number of different um cohorts, and we uh, the Rocky Mountain Myrick, we're so lucky that we have uh, been able to kind of, as a group, be very successful in funding. So we have researchers that work on homelessness and suicide. We have researchers that are working on um, justice, uh, justice involved veterans and suicide. We have researchers who are working on financial empowerment. Uh, and so uh, financial stress and stressors and suicide, uh, because uh, you're from Senator Chester's office, so I'll talk about a huge effort that we have around rural veterans. Uh, we know veterans that our rural communities are at a very increased risk for suicide. And I'm super lucky to uh, be one of the leads of a program called Together with Veterans. Uh, we have communities in Montana that we're working with who are incredible. Uh, this Together with Veterans project is identifying communities and then using community participatory efforts to identify best ways to prevent suicide in rural communities, helping veterans and um, allies and care systems and I mean I've been to some amazing places uh Bartlesville Oklahoma I, I will tell you about all the amazing places I've been amazing uh but you know so we've had mayors come all all these folks come and really figure out what does that community need to do to prevent suicide in their community uh one of the things I really love about this program is that we've heard today this isn't just a veteran issue uh we are all on our own mental health journey all of us can do better. Uh, it turns out mental health is kind of like physical exercise. You can't just be like, well, I exercised in 1986 and now I'm good, right? So mental health is ongoing. And um, for a lot of our veterans, um, being involved in Together with Veterans, teaching, sharing, educating, um, organizing in their communities is actually their own suicide prevention strategy too. It's giving reasons for living and meaning to their own lives. So I'd love to talk more about Together with Veterans and ways we're helping bring suicide prevention out of the clinics, into communities, and really then personalize. And we talk a lot about personalized medicine. This is personalized suicide prevention based on the communities that people are in. Um, second question was about open, like having... Um, yeah, sorry. Families. Okay, so I, I'm going to say something kind of a little bit to the side of it, and then, you know, I think uh, there are challenges in terms of kind of who we can treat in the VA, and I, that's way beyond my pay grade, so I'm not going to go there today. Um, several things I do want you to know about, though, is there are programs in the VA that are really supporting family members, helping their veterans get into care, right? And so coaching into care, I'm not sure if you've heard of that before, it's an excellent program where we're working with family members to support them and their veterans in terms of getting into care. Um, we also on our website have resources around how to talk to family members and young kids. And we have it for each developmental stage, how to talk to family members around suicide and suicide attempts. We actually have it both in Spanish and English because we just found that uh, families don't know how to talk about this. Um, and so finding words. And the other thing that's really interesting, and, and I don't know why this is, that this is in suicide prevention on the whole, is there just hasn't been a ton of effort around family-based interventions for suicide prevention. There are no, um, I, I, there are no, I'm trying to think if this is true. Just in terms of most of the focus on more traditional therapies had been on individual interventions. And I think part of the challenge with this, and this is um, just my thinking, and I'm not sure it's 100%, is that families play different roles for different people. And so sometimes families are super protective and people, if they're filling out their safety plans, they have their family members all over it. Sometimes family members can really uh, create risk and relationships with families can create risk. So I think we've had a hard time identifying interventions that can kind of pull both of those and, and proceed. So that, that's what I got on that one. I'm sure there's more, but thank you. And uh, we really appreciate all the support. Always. <laughs> I've got a question. Um, kind of pulling in a little bit of um, what... No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so kind of pulling in a little bit of uh, the challenges from a geographic standpoint. Um, I was wondering if you had any visibility on uh, what the efforts are. That's something that's beyond beyond the continental United States. So when we're talking, 
we were talking about Guam earlier, but I mean, those we have actual facilities, but what about our Northern Marianas where we don't have a facility? What are we doing? Because one of the things that I, when I came on board is that I, I believe every veteran, no matter where they are, or where they live, serves the same benefits. And so how are we working towards that? And I didn't know if you had visibility or have research that we we're working on regarding that. Yeah, and I do not want to pretend like I'm. this is 1 million percent me speaking for me. Okay, so, um, I, you know, I was a little bit like, can I go to Guam? Like, it's a really long trip and it's not super cheap. And is, is it going to be okay? And VA travel office did ask why I was going, but. But once I got there, I totally realized, like, oh, my gosh, we actually have to go to these places and spend time there to find out the problems, mm -hmm. you know? And I think um, it, it really, um, the a travel office should ask me, too. It's weird to have a research from Colorado go to Guam. So that was good. Um, good oversight. So, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think I found a number of things that are challenging that are just, um, you wouldn't know unless we're there. And some of it's just really um, pedestrian in terms of kind of like, um, what does it mean? This is so in the weeds, but what does it mean if, and I'm going to get these wrong, but I, I think the time difference, and you can help me, I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, I was like half crazy from jet lag when I was there, but I believe that Guam is 20 hours behind um, Hawaii. And so what that means is if you're trying to cross cover and you're trying to cross cover, so you have... Um, let's say suicide prevention coordinators in Hawaii and suicide prevention coordinators in Guam. And you've got more suicide prevention coordinators in Hawaii and one suicide prevention coordinator in Guam. To try to find ways to cover when something is that far away is really challenging, right? And so there's just these huge logistic challenges. So I've been having a series of phone calls with folks about this. One of the other things that um, we identified that I think there is some really good movement about is medications. Um, in Guam, there is um, only United States Postal Service goes there, which is awesome that it does, but uh, VA delivers medications through the mail. And uh, Guam also doesn't have addresses everywhere uh, on their homes. And so all the, the medications go to um, the um, main postal service. And the time that it can take is really, really long. So one thing we're working on is, okay, what happens when somebody needs a refill? Um, and maybe the policies that are in place around refill in Denver don't make sense for Guam. Right. Uh, we also have tons of veterans in Saipan. Uh, we also have veterans, I'll, I'll just say this. So this, I would love to have a conversation with this. I am like an everyday you know, about this. Every day I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. So, but, no. so if you are a veteran, if you don't know this, there's lots of veterans that are recruited that live in the Philippines, right? And the, the um, you know this, that you know this, right? That the, the VA is in the embassy. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you can't provide care in a right. different country, so Correct. you can't do telehealth in the Philippines. So there's uh, anyway, we should talk because I am on a rampage about this <laughs> in a good way. It's a rampage, yes. But yes, let's talk. There's a lot of that has to be done. Yes, that's way above my pay grade. I mean, we can work together with everybody. Some of this is also congressional stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, way beyond my pay grade. I think she had a question. So my name is Katie. I'm from um, uh, I'm a person in the law arts office. So this is a thank you so much for being here. I am really amazed with the story. I think everybody will read it, will very emotional. But I guess to touch on to the story about you know sexual assault and like violence and for women veterans and women to serve in the yeah in the military system. I guess uh, my question is, what is the limit, like, what is the restriction that causes these women to, like, not speak out against, like, their violence? I push the button. Oh, it's already on. Sorry. Oh, no, I do push it. Sorry. <laughs> um, so a lot of times when it comes to uh, the, the biggest reason why a lot of women do not speak out um, is, is shame. They, they, feel like they deserve to have whatever happened to them happen to them. I mean, um, from my own personal experience, I got married after only dating somebody for four months. So why wouldn't I deserve this type of situation? I mean, I didn't vet the person effectively. I, my parents dated for two years and that's kind of the 
the, um, the, the map that I thought that I would follow, but he was beautiful and very smooth talking. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was a loser before I joined the Navy. And now this beautiful man is talking to me. And within a couple of weeks of dating, he asked me to marry him. So yes, of course I will marry you. Um, so there, there's a lot of um, shame. And then additionally, just um, there's ramifications that can come from talking about what happens to you, whether that be because something happened to you by your spouse and people will think that you're lying or something happened to you by a superior officer. So um, a lot of that can go into why people do not report uh, what, what happens. As a follow-up, is any any had a husband, especially the best time to try to like prevent this from happening? Like try to I say like empower him to talk more about this thing, but make it easier for him to report. Uh, when it comes to the issue of military sexual trauma specifically, because that's what we talk about um, the most recently, there were provisions included in last year's NDAA that removed um, um, military sexual assaults and then also domestic violence and child abuse from the chain of command's decision to prosecute and put it, it is going to put it in the hands of a special trial counsel. Um, that is still being being worked out. And so hopefully that will encourage more to report and talk about what has happened. But when it comes to the military, the lack of information is just so great. We're not told about a lot of these services. And um, as we in the room often, again, like I said, talk about military sexual assault and military sexual trauma, we don't often talk about intimate partner violence. We don't talk about it like it even exists. When I was in the military, I didn't even know that there was a program called, um, uh, I didn't know that there was the FAT program. And um, so that in itself would have possibly given me an outlet to talk about what had happened to me, but I didn't even know about it. Uh, and, and I think if we can push out these um, these resources more. And additionally, I talked about I talked about uh, storytelling. I think that if we could hear more from leadership on their journeys and the things, if they were comfortable, like I said before, um, if they were comfortable talking about their journeys and the how they received help and then them also talking about resources, I think that that would get passed down to the lower the lower ranking. Can I also just add finances to, to this conversation? Um, many of us are in families where our finances are commingled. Many women uh, take time to help raise children, which um, is uh, often not recognized as such important and, and potentially unpaid labor and actually having the resource to be able to start over or to leave or to, to make sure that you have what you need can just be hugely challenging. and. We know that financial stress is also um, a risk factor for suicide. So I think you know women are in really uh, trying to juggle so many things and balance their needs, the needs of their kids and their families. And uh, I, I think we just need to find unique ways uh, other than, uh, of course, I think telling your story is like a huge first step. And then how do we help women who have told their story have the resource that they need to take care of themselves and their families? Um, thank you again for all of your stories and all of your insight. Um, I'm actually a member of the Air Force as well, and I agree that we don't really know about the resources available. And so from the DOD perspective, somebody who's in the military, um, can you tell us more about programs that are available or programs that you wish you saw while you were in the military that could help you out? Um, things that even myself, I mean, I'm a senior airman, a lower ranking, right? Things that I can do as well as we can try to support. Uh, so I can speak yes a little bit on that. Um, and uh, one of the programs that was available when I was in uh, was the Fleet Family. Um, I don't exactly know what the Air Force. I'm sorry. Yeah, airman, and family. airman and Family Readiness. Um, and so they do offer um, counseling services and things like that. And they are able to refer um, you to other resources if you need them. Additionally, though, one of the things I think is also a concern is 
that um, talking about the things that happen to you um, can have ramifications potentially for your job. Uh, maybe somebody is married to another uh, service member and they don't want them to have ramifications for their job. And so that can be uh, another um, um, prohibitive thing that, that I didn't discuss, but I definitely think reaching out to that. And then I believe it's still called that family advocacy program um, is also available. Um, and uh, that should be um, on the TOD website. And I, mean, I don't have all of the resources in front of me, but there there are a lot, but I think Lourdes has. Yeah, um, there's, from a reporting standpoint, though, I think it's just going to be important. Um, there's the, called it SHARP, so called Rocky yes. Assault Prevention. So there's, in other words, it's SAPR. Um, mm -hmm. So those are places where you can get resources to be informed and share, as well as also do reporting. The other one that I don't think is well known yet, is, or as well known, is the CATCH program. Yes. Um, so the CATCH program is great because you can actually report anonymously. And so you, it, when you put your reporting in, it goes into this inter-service database to find any potential uh, serial offenders. But this is a way for you to be able to put your report in writing officially without having the potential fear of ramifications simply coming back. And then because it, it does look to see if that person has had has had a report before, you get that information, you can make a decision if you want to go forward with an actual unrestricted report. Yeah. I just wanted to recognize Congresswoman Jennifer Gonzalez Colon who joined before we take other questions. I um, wanted to introduce her. Congressman Gonzalez Colon was elected to represent Puerto Rico in 2016 and serves on the Natural Resources and Transportation and Infrastructure Committees. As a member of the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus, she's recently worked to improve mental health care and suicide prevention for veterans through the Zero Suicide Initiative pilot program. Congressman? Sorry about being so late. As you may know, we are returning from visas and all the conferences are going on and the committees and <laughs> but I I couldn't be away and, and at least spend a few minutes with you guys here. And the reason for that is that uh, I want to thank all the people from the Congressional Policy Institute um, and the Disabled Americans, uh, Veterans of America and Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America who are working alongside the Congressional Conference uh, to hold this briefing on women's, uh, veterans, women's uh, mental health and suicide prevention. We've been working on this issue in my office. I was part of the Veteran Affairs Committee when I, I was assigned here in Congress in 2017. And uh, knowing firsthand what happens when you've got a lot of population in the case of Puerto Rico, uh, they're very proud to serve in our, our military forces, but then back home, they don't have uh, the, the the treatment they, they need because we don't have the facilities uh, as, in terms of mental health. Actually, they're building, VA is building one right now, at least to have 40 beds. Uh, but that's another challenge. I, I, I think that a um, woman has served armed forces uh, throughout her nation history. You know that better than anyone else. And in recent years, women have become the fastest growing group within the veteran population with more than 2 million women uh, veterans living in the U.S. Uh, and, and those numbers are important. Uh, the percentage of women veterans is 18% by 2040. Uh, in 2019, the number of women veterans reported in Puerto Rico was uh, 4,330. Comparable just to states like Wyoming, Vermont, D.C., and Rhode Island, which makes me immense, uh, immensely proud. Um, like their male counterparts, uh, women veterans experience challenge related to military service, um, including readjustment issues, post traumatic uh, distress disorder, military sexual trauma, and that's another issue that we do have legislation in that, in that part. Um, sleep problems, depression, anxiety, physical injury, among many other issues that like their male counterparts, we need to ensure federal agencies like the Department of Veteran Affairs rise to the challenge of accommodating a changing veteran population and the increased participation and demands of women veterans. And we need to make that happen, not just in theory, not just sending a memo, but actually 
changing uh, the way the, the VA is conducting their uh, service to uh, women's veterans. Even though, even though um, VA has reported has reported lower incidence of women veteran suicide among those uh, served by Veterans Health Administration compared to the male veterans, they have noticed that uh, there's an increase in the age adjusted suicide rate among women veterans from 2005 to 2015. And, and those numbers, you know, raise a big flag for all of those. But those are troubling findings that require a close attention and must propel us to seek alternatives. So this kind of treatment helps uh, the Congressional Institute to help us out to find what, what should be the next uh, course of action in the administrative way, legislation, and I would also like for us to keep in mind that uh, and pay particular attention to the needs of women veterans in rural and territorial jurisdictions, uh, like my home state, like Puerto Rico. They often face increased challenges stemming from limited services offered by the VA across the board uh, for both male and female. Um, and this includes, includes uh, physician shortages limitations with mental health services and issues with the hiring and retention of specialists. And this is something that you can see all across the nation. Uh, and women veterans have been trained and tested and many ready to continue their contributions to our nation now as civilians. Uh, so we need to ensure they get the proper uh, tools to make that happen. And I think Congress is a valuable stakeholder in this discussion and as co-chair the Women Caucus um, the first woman to be elected from Puerto Rico to actually deal with this issue, I would like to be as helpful as I can be and willing to consider any proposal you think is important uh, and useful in supporting uh, this segment of our population. So in that sense, either through strengthening and collaboration with the VA or the Department of Defense prior to separation from their forces, or increasing and supporting outreach uh, through the VSOs, or increasing contact with local stakeholders like you know all veterans advocates in the states or organizations like this one. I, I, I would love to be more than willing to continue this discussion. Actually, as a matter of fact, in Puerto Rico, I do have a veteran task force, uh, and we met twice a year, and we just did our, our meeting for this semester, and they're all VSOs, all federal agencies and local agencies as well. Um, and this is one of the issues that have always brought, you know, mental uh, situation and, and awareness. So any way we can help, please don't, don't be shy and don't think uh, that it's not going to happen. I think if we all together find the same thing, we can, we can get things done. So thank you. I'm sorry I need to leave, but I uh, want to say again, thank you to the Congressional Institute uh, for organizing this and all of you for actually bringing the ideas to it. Thank you. It's okay, I want to ask just one last question to all of our speakers. In, a, in one minute or less, what are one or two primary takeaways that you hope policymakers will consider in their work? We can start with either Caitlin or oh, Naomi. Okay. Um, to encourage to encourage other, uh, to encourage women veterans specifically to tell their story. I've said that a lot, um, and to really look into and focus on intimate partner violence. It's again, like I said, something that's not talked about. And one thing that I forgot to mention when you asked your question, and just a quick name drop, um, IEVA has a comprehensive case management program called the Quick Reaction Force. And what this program is, it's available 365 days a year, 24/7. Doesn't matter when or where you are, you can call in or uh, visit our website and get in touch with a person, a live person that will help you access whatever resources you are looking for. So whether that is you're trying to figure out um, where to go because of a situation you've been through, you are struggling with food insecurity, um, you are trying to navigate your VA benefits, um, the Quick Reaction Force is available and that's at quickreactionforce.org or 855-91-RAPID. Uh, and again, available 365, 24 seven to any veteran, any era, any discharge status, doesn't matter. So just had a name drop for the guest. See, this is what I mean by we need a community, right? 
So IAVA offers that. Um, I, I would say having the VSOs uh, involved as early as possible with the either soon to be veteran, right? You're a senior airman, and what do you know about DAV? I know it exists. You know it exists, <laughs> but do you know the programs that are available? If we're if we are able to have um, be a little bit more forward on this is you know the transition part. Uh, DAV does have a transition service program, and we have uh, over 30 transition service officers throughout the United States on military installations. But currently, we're working under just a fast letter from a general that's actually not even you know uh, serving anymore. He's retired. So it would be beneficial to have some sort of policy that would allow um, the VSOs to be able to be a part of that process as early as possible so that we can continue the relationship with them throughout and show them, look, these are your resources. This is, this is what you have available. Um, again, thankfully, I had DAV um, that through a matter of luck, really, um, I was able to, to get with them a little bit early. So I would just say that, that that as far as policy is concerned, that is something that I think really needs to be um, kind of looked into. Well, I, I would be hesitant to comment on policy, but one thing I would say is that um, I, I think anything that we, each of us can do, all of us can do to help rethink mental health is just being part of health. Right, and I think actually younger folks are way smarter about this than we are. Um, there's some younger folks that that's you, you're smarter. Um, mental health is just health, and we we need to find ways to help people understand that. We need to find ways to help people realize that it's okay to talk about suicide. I was on a call um, recently with actually professionals who were really afraid, like if they said the word suicide to folks, that that would make people suicidal. I'm like, they already know they're suicidal. You're not going to make them suicidal by bringing it up. They're actually going to feel like you're with them. So how, how do we work together in all ways to, to understand that mental health is just Thank you so much. And I know that Cindy is going to come and give some closing remarks. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you everyone. This briefing is always a favorite for all of our staff um, for good reason. Today was no exception. Um, we really thank each of our speakers for your willingness to share your stories. Very powerful, very inspiring, and really helpful for us to hear too. Those of us that are trying to work with policymakers um, to help frame uh, better solutions, and to the and also to Dr. Brennan too, and uh, also to the women members who spoke. Um, we have such wonderful champions um, among the women members and male members too. Um, and so much of this should and usually is bipartisan. Um, so we feel like this is such a rich area to be even more active. Um, we do hope that this briefing has provided each of you and those on uh, virtually with a better understanding of the unique experiences and challenges faced by women veterans and will serve as a resource when bipartisan legislation is drafted in the next Congress. And this Congress is not over yet. We've heard references to legislation that has not quite finished. Um, the conversation was recorded and should be available for viewing on our website at wcpinst.org tomorrow. A short survey about today's discussion is at each seat. I see the green forms. And we also, um, anyone attending remotely will receive the survey at the end of the event. Um, look for it on your browser immediately afterwards. Thanks again to the Bipartisan Women's Caucus leadership, both members and staff, our co-sponsors, DAV and IAVA, longtime sponsors uh, and partners, and Lumbach LLC for their support for this briefing. They supported last year's briefing too. I just want to note that. They do care about these issues. And thanks, of course, to our moderator, Cynthia Ramos, who it should be noted is leaving our staff in two weeks. She's been with us for three years and has been such a champion on this issue and so many others. Um, thank you, Cynthia. 
And also thanks to Chloe Scott, our communications associate, Valerie Franco, who you heard from, um, who worked so hard on this briefing and the rest of our WCPI team doing various tasks um, for this, uh, to make this briefing possible. So thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time. Oh, thank you so much.